when I used to race bikes, um, actually, I'm, I'm quite I'm quite happy to say, when I used to race bikes in the States, um, in the AMA, um, I got my butt kicked by um, a young lady um, repeatedly. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I'm happy to say it because this is this is the same, this same young lady, but I want to become the first woman woman to um, to win to win a race in my class um, and and win races successfully. I mean, and and convincingly. Hello and welcome to everyone. It is a special day for us and today is a special day, the value of sports. What does sports mean to the world? It is a huge, huge billion dollar industry. But what is sports? Sports is made up of a number of things and people who combine to be able to be part of sports. But sports is a wider audience because what makes sports tick? People like Carl Blankendel, who's my co-host, he's the one that makes sports tick. And we have a special guest who is not involved in football, not involved in cricket, but would have played some cricket and football a long time ago, but is now into Formula One. And I know for Dev, this is an exciting time because he likes Formula One. And I also know that we have some other folks who are part of our team. They're into Formula One. We have a race car driver who's also part of our team. So this will be an exciting interview. But what we want to do is to be able to make sure that we can educate the young boy and girl as to the next future development of what is going to happen in the world of sports. And even though we might be in a pandemic, we certainly have to make sure that we position ourselves to make sure that we can dream for our young boys and girls. And that's why we have for our first conversation, Mr. Antoine Richards. Carl and myself, we're pleased to be able to have you on our platform, The Value of Sports. And I know that you would bring some greetings to you. First of all, welcome and just quietly tell us a little bit about Antoine. We know you're from Bermuda, but we're in Bermuda. Okay, sure. First of all, let me thank you guys for having me on. Um, Brian and Cal, this is a, a great platform and I appreciate the opportunity to come and you know offer my my insight. Um, yeah, so um, Antoine, I'm from Bermuda, um, 34 years old, so um, kind of been getting back into to student life a little bit late, but it's it's been very successful, very productive. Um, from Bermuda, I'm from Devonshire, you know, um, right in the center, center, center of the country. Um, went to Elliot and Whitney and Roy Academy for all of my Bermudians who are listening out. Um, so right now I'm living in England. Um, I live, I've been studying here in Oxford for um, two years. Um, I go to Oxford Brooks University, uh, which is not the same as the other one, but it's still a very, very good school. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're here to talk about um, some Formula One. Um, I'm very, very honored to have recently um, picked up a, a one-year internship um, working for a, a Formula One team, a, a very good Formula One team. And um, so I'm, a, I'm an engineer um, by, by study and by training now. Um, I focus on uh, electrical, electronic engineering um and that's sort of what i'm doing for this formula one team so from your primary school days show you would have played a little bit of football like a bit of cricket tell us about those days in bermuda yeah um i remember back my my, my days playing football for wolves as a cub i weren't that good <laughs> which is part of the reason why i didn't stick with it <laughs> um i could be a fan but that was about it <laughs> um i played some cricket too um actually i i yeah, play quite a bit of cricket. Um, so just just cool stuff, um, and I loved it. You know, I think I think part of the reason um, that I chose to pursue other sports is is because you know coming from the islands, we have a lot of footballers, a lot a lot of cricketers, 
um, and you know it was it was it was something that I, that I enjoyed. I enjoyed watching a good match, you know, watching a good game. But I wasn't, uh, you know, for myself personally, I, I didn't see myself um, wanting to really pursue these sports. So I used to play all this place. We played pretty random sports. I played tennis for a while. I played rugby for a while. Um, but any any sort of sport, I will always pick up. Um, I didn't start um, my most passionate sport, my most my favorite, my the sport that's helped to define my life right now, which is um, racing. So I, I got into bike racing back in Bermuda um, after right after high school. Um, so I'm talking about the street bikes, the guys that are riding around, putting their knees in the ground, riding 600 cc's um, race bikes and stuff. So I started racing in Bermuda. Um, up at the uh, track and south side of the BMRA, um, and uh, there was a really good group of, of racers um, that were um, really active at the time. So um, I got to train people like David Jones and um, Skinny and uh, Toriana Wilson, who uh, was a really big star for Bermuda at the time, um, still. And um, yeah, so sports was always my love coming up. Um, cricket and football um, were were the sports that you know all the cool guys played. I just went play with my other sports because you know I had more fun doing them. <laughs> That's arguments. I want to talk a little bit about your family background, your mom and your dad, because I think it is important that folks understand how grounded you started. And grounded mean what was your upbringing? With your family and to every yep. time we yep. speak to someone they always talk about their family and we want to take some time out to be able to just touch in those areas um about your family yeah i'm more than happy talking about my family um so again for anybody who's for me is listening the, the first question is huge peoples well uh, my my mom's side uh the francis's from low hill and so on and then my uh, dad's side of the richards and the browns um, from Dock Hill area, Devonshire, and basically my mom and dad um, were always supportive um, of me, no matter what I pursued, um, and I was always very, very happy and thankful for that. Um, you know, uh, my, my brother as well, um, he's always been uh, support for me um, when I was pursuing my own racing, um, and I, when I was pursuing anything, um, he's also a, a good athlete himself, he prefers to uh, do the, um, the the contact sports uh, or well, combat sports, you know, boxing and MMA stuff. Um, and I got into the bike racing. So from my mom, I got to give her a lot of credit because she had two boys who who didn't go out and you know pursue your your average sort of you know friendly go watch your, your kids go um, run around on a track on Saturday mornings. No, she was watching one son hop on a 600 cc bike and ride around at 100 miles an hour doing crazy stuff and her other son was getting in boxing rings and stuff and doing all that so she's uh she's a strong woman she's able to to keep us uh grounded keep us focused uh, you know and, and give us the support we needed even though you know from a mom's perspective that's never used to watch um and then obviously my dad um also really really great he used to be um big into tennis which is kind of right started playing tennis and then um, he was also big into um, motocross. He used to race up Kearney Island um, way back in the day, and um, that's where I got my 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 need for speed from. So, from a, a, from a solid family, from a solid household, um, I was very very lucky to be able to, you know, have the foundation um, that allowed me to go and you know pick up different things, um, try things, pick it up, put it down, you know, and know that. Regardless, I would always have the support of uh, of the family to come behind me. So it it gave me it empowered me to go out and and try different things. And you know, I I just as I get older, um, the more and more grateful I become of of having that that family structure that you know there's there's had created a platform for me that's allowed me to go out and just do do different things. It is important that you mention the word grateful because today. Carl and myself, we're grateful that we're alive and we're grateful that we can be able to share this same stage with you because for us, we consider you to be a legend. Transformation from Bermuda 
to England, you'd have had many options. You could have, when you got to England, could have decided that this, and I'm not going to get into this. What made you tick when you got to England? Um, even though you know what you wanted to go and study, what, what were the opportunities like ahead of you before you started studying engineering? Well, um, the the first the opportunity that really kind of kicked things off for me to even go to England um, was something that I was working on back home in Bermuda. Um, I have been working closely with a, a, a company organization that's been putting on some really exciting events um, in the last few years in Bermuda um, called the Bermuda Charge. And um, basically what we're doing is we are creating events that drive excitement around electric vehicles. Um, because from my background in racing and bikes and motorsports and everything, I, I've seen how the transformation is going from petrol to electric. And um, I, you know, there was an uh, opportunity to work with a, a, a young a guy back home who um, had, some, had a really, really exciting idea. And I happened to be in a position to help him move it along. And so it got me thinking about, okay, well, you know, I'm going to be involved with helping to try to drive electric vehicles in Bermuda and hopefully uh, and abroad. Um, what else can I do uh, to not just be promoting and putting on events or whatever, but how, how can I really get involved? How can I really get stuck in with, um, with this industry? Um, and this uh, opportunity is coming along with it, you know, with everything getting electric. Um, you know, I, I just figured that, you know, right now, uh, you know, you can go, I'll speak to you because that's, that's where I know I love, um, you can go take a, a old B50, you know, take it to a guy and he'll be able to strip the bike in, at, at night, strip it down to, to its nuts and bolts and rebuild the thing with, with, with almost like no light, you know, just because we have such a, um, experience and, and really like expertise with with our bikes and, and our vehicles in Bermuda um, and I always figured with things getting electric that's that's going to be the next stage you know in 10 years time people's going to be I don't know maybe not tuning in the carburetors you know um, by flashlight you know on the side of the road but um, maybe repairing a circuit board <laughs> for their electric bike or something, you know, that kind of thing. So I just figured that there's going to be opportunity um, for, you know, up, up, upskilling uh, people um, to get ready for this uh, this new electrical era we're, we're, we're going into now. And so I decided, well, look, let me go and let me go back and try and study. Let me go back and because you know it's it's a whole it's a whole different science from um, what we know with mechanical uh, bikes and all that. Um, so I decided to go back and study, and that's where I decided, yeah, let me go back to England because there's good opportunities here, some good skills here, um, and some some programs that were really exciting. Um, so Oxford Brooks University that I'm at, um, it's one of the few schools in the country that offers a, a degree in motorsports, motorsports engineering. So um, it's heavily based in mechanical engineering, so learning about you know um, uh, working with metals and uh, composites and so all sorts of different physical uh, uh, materials, um, but also has a lot of um, emphasis on electrical vehicles because um, even with petrol vehicles, so much now is controlled by uh, electronics, and then going forward, it's going to be even more. So. My, my school is is actually quite good in teaching both sides, mechanical and electrical engineering, together in this motorsports engineering course, and it's it's really well it's really well known because we uh, we compete uh, engineering competition that happens out here every year. Um, we build a race car from scratch, and we're um, known as being one of the top. When your body is challenged, it burns fuel and energy. Respond to every challenge with Altitude Sports Drink. It replenishes, restores, and prepares you for the next level. Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. 
altitude. Raise your game. Carbon Sports Management Group would like to take some time out to also say thanks to a number of persons who have made our podcast possible in a very big way. And our special guest this morning is a Formula One engineering architect from Bermuda who is applying his trade in the United Kingdom on the big world stage, Antoine Richards. And we just really want to just take some time out to really salute him in a very big way. Carl Blankendel and Vernon Springer, a real honor um, for Antoine. Yes, definitely. I mean, coming from a small island like Bermuda to have Antoine be part of the Formula One racing circuit, which is very difficult to even get into. And it's not something that is promoted when you are a young person in Bermuda to say, hey, you can have a future in engineering for a professional team that travels around the world with the fastest vehicles known to man, especially in our 21 square mile island where there's only two lanes at 31 miles an hour. We're told to go slow and Anton's told to, you know, be as crazy as you can. The police will be <laughs> like, you're not a poster boy for the young man and women in Bermuda because he's talking about speed. And as anyone knows, our roads are so small and treacherous that going even at the normal speed you most likely will get some road rash which is a, a local term that means you've hit the pavement but you survived and those scars stay with you for the rest of your life but antoine oh, yeah and i have mine on the same one but the show. <laughs> yeah but antoine um i'm gonna go straight to the meat we have some young people that are going to be online listening to this and all they really want to know is who are some of the famous people in Formula One that you have crossed paths with, even if you were just able to see them from a distance, social distancing in the COVID-19 <laughs> era? Yeah. Um, so I've only been around for a few months now, so I'm still finding my feet. But um, I have uh, got to go to um, watch the British GP this year, and uh, I got to see... Sir Lewis Hamilton win his a uh, uh, big race that year um, that that weekend. Um, that was real special for me. Uh, my first time um, seeing a Formula One race, um, and it was certainly memorable. So that was that's a, that's gonna stick with me for sure. Um, and then, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I've also run into some other um, big name, big name F1 drivers. Uh, Fernando Alonso is one in particular that I. Uh, got to rub his shoulders with um, for for a few minutes, so that was also very very exciting. Um, you know, these guys are larger than life figures for me. Um, people that I grew up watching on TV since you know from 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 childhood, and um, yeah, it's 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 really interesting to be now not not an outsider in this in, in the sport. You know, I can I can I can walk up to someone like uh, Fernando Alonso and. You know, I'm not going to introduce myself to him, but you know, like it's it's not it's not far fetched to to say like yeah, well, you know, um, hey, you know, let's let's talk about the last race or let's 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 talk about this and let's talk about that. So that's the that's that's really exciting. It for for a sport that is is you know by its nature is very elite. You know, like you just said earlier, like it's it's, it's hard to get into. It's crazy expensive to to be involved with um, if you're not getting paid. So um, yeah, it's it's. It's from from the extent from a small island like 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 I'm from. It wasn't something that even crossed my mind. Like even even when I came to England, it wasn't on my mind to to pursue this. Like it was always in the back of my mind, but it was always like you know, a, a, a pipe dream. So yeah, uh, I'm very happy to to be able to feel like I'm a part of a, a, a industry that um, has been like a uh, just a whole different level. Um, for for most of my life. Yes, I heard the passion and excitement in your voice. It's like, you know, you've seen the elite stars, but it's like I haven't really gotten too close to them as I want to. I want to rub, besides rub my shoulders, I want to shake hands or or bump fists these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now we see we see Sir Lewis Hamilton. We see 
um, all the other great drivers, Max Verstappen, and they get into a vehicle and they go around the track and, you know, there's the, the grid, the qualifying races. But how important are you to the team? Tell us exactly what do you do or your group, your division in that Formula One team? What are you guys really responsible for? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a electronic integration engineer. And so my main focus is um, around the car. Um, everything's pretty much made, uh, custom made, right? It's a, it's a Formula One car. You don't just go and buy parts for it. So everything's going to be made from scratch. Um, there are, are, are lots of electrical components on the car. And right now my job is focused mainly on designing the hardware that helps to um, position and locate and secure the electrical components in, in the car. So stuff like all the different connectors, all the different, um, um, the, the routes that the uh, cables and the wiring, the looms they take to get from point A to point B. Um, and essentially any other um, electrical component that needs to be put on the car it's my team's job to make sure that it, it it goes where it goes, it stays where it goes. It doesn't come flying off when you, know, when you hit the brakes or something like that, <laughs> which when you talk about a, a car that goes 200 miles an hour and slams brakes and get like 4G, 5G deceleration, it's, it's you know, it, it actually, it takes a bit of, a bit of thought to make sure that, you know, you don't hit the brakes and then have a computer come flying out the front of the car. Um, but yeah, that's basically our job is to uh, design the hardware for the electronic components and so it's focused really um, in terms of the performance of the car. Um, right, right now we're more we're more on the reliability side. So we're rely we're the ones that you know make sure the car doesn't um, shut down for no apparent reason. Um, so there are other divisions of the of the team. So we are you know we're we're electrical sorry engineering design office. So for me particularly, I'm actually focusing on our car for um, the upcoming years. Um, there are other parts of the team that focus on the performance of the car, um, this year's car. So those are the ones that are looking at different um, fueling strategies and um, algorithms and all the, all the different um, really interesting stuff that helps to make our cars go a little bit faster on a Sunday. Um, you have other parts of the team that do research and development, um, looking at you know exciting new um, state-of-the-art ideas for future cars, um, yeah, and several other, you know, uh, divisions. You know, it's it's not a joke when you hear people like uh, Lewis or Max saying that it's a uh, it's a team effort. You know, you see you see the guys uh, sitting on the podium by themselves, but there's a full team effort behind them. Um, and now being on the inside, I can actually see what it what it takes. Um, and yeah, man, it's 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 a lot. <laughs> you know, it's. Um, Every single part of the car, um, it take you know any single part of the car has three, four, five people work, looking at it, you know, approving it, making sure that it's it does exactly what it does because you need to get one shot, you know. If I'm designing, a, you know, say I'm designing a a, a little tray to hold a a, a component, electric component. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still new, so I don't know everything. Um, but if I don't get my part right, then my manager will. And if you don't get it, then the boss person above him will. Um, and yet all these people paying attention to thousands of parts that you have on a car uh, to make it run. And like I said, like this, most of these parts are built in house. You know, we don't do just go to the shop and buy a, uh, um, different, you know, nuts and bolts and all the kind of stuff, you know, some of these things are made from, from, from scratch, you know, and the, the factory that I work in is really, really amazing because everything you need to build a home on one car is there, um, which is pretty incredible. Like, you know, it's this huge factory, um, the machine shop, I mean, like, it looks like a hospital. Like you look in the, um, where they do the building, the carbon fiber bits and all that. Looks like a hospital. I mean, you got people walking around with like you know hairnets and gloves and you know the the full clean out outfits and everything. Man, it's really really impressive, um, and it shows you just how 
yeah, like, you know, Formula One is the top of the top. Like there's, like there is no one, there's no other real um, championship that compares on a level of um, professionalism and um, and and effort. Yeah. How many people? Yeah. And to inform part of the team, because that's a lot of people you're talking about there. Yeah, um, I'll be I'll be generic, and I'll say that most Formula One teams probably have somewhere between six hundred to twelve hundred people. Wow! So six hundred is probably towards this. You know, I'll say five six hundred is probably towards the smaller smaller side. So you think about teams that are towards the middle, towards the back of the of the grid. Then you start getting teams like the Mercedes and the Red Bulls and the, uh, the Ferraris and all that. Yeah, you now you're look, talking about over a thousand people. And so, what's the weight of a car? Uh, because there has to be a science behind. Just listening to you just a while ago, I was taking some notes. So, what's the weight of of a car, Formula One car? Because if, if I'm listening to you, the science now uh, is it the lighter the car, the faster it goes? Am mm -hmm. I right based on what you're saying? Yeah, that, that comes from yeah the most simple physics that yeah um, basically the car's lighter then it will it can move faster it can um, accelerate faster it can brake uh, faster it can carry more uh, it can turn faster you know carry more lateral g's when it's turning so um, yeah the lighter the car the better um, I have to admit I, I off the top of my head I can't remember what our, what our car weighs um, I probably wouldn't be able to say it if I did um, but it's um but yeah no it's it's all everything about um, what we do like for me every time i'm designing something you know even small things literally something that could be this big but um <laughs> we still spend a lot of time you know seeing where we can find where we can save grams grams like per component you know if you can save two percent of the weight in each small component then across the entire car you can knock off kilos and that's that's literally what Formula One is all about. It's about finding these small, we call them incremental gains, um, you know, where you can just make a small difference here, and then across the entire car, and then across an entire season of the championship, it make big. It makes a huge difference, you know. If you can, if you can save five kilos on a car, maybe you can go, you know, one tenth of a of a second faster per lap. That one tenth of a second. At the end of a 70 lap race turns into you know a minute that you've saved over the entire course of the race you know and that's the difference between uh, a minute that's that's the difference between you know getting a podium and not scoring points so this is this is the level of detail that um in formula one we just focus on like literally everything's all about it it's all about how you can make things lighter you know Sometimes stiffer, sometimes not. But yeah, there's, it's it's, it's very much uh, pursue, pursuing excellence. Now we're talking about <clears throat> time here. So, so on any given game day, you're talking about twelve to fourteen hours on the track. No, no, not that much. Um, so the way the race the races work is not over one day. You have over a weekend. So on Fridays you have practice. On Saturdays you have qualifying, and then on Sunday you have the race. And so on Friday practice, what tends to happen is you would um, it's literally just that you get I think you get two sessions um, about about I think forty minutes or hour. I don't quite remember. Um, and um, in those practice sessions, you know, from a, from a team's point of view, um, from the engineering point of view, um, those are the times for the drivers to go out and to test stuff, test new components, test new parts, um, also to gather data. You know, um, right now, everything in Formula One is data driven. There are like in any given race, we, we produce gigabytes, gigabytes of, of data that transfers from the track back to the factory is analyzed in real, a lot of it's analyzed in real time um, to help drive decisions at the track. Which is what I'm saying. Like it's a it's a full team effort. You know, you see a race, you see the race team, you see the the, the big um, transporter vehicle van uh, trucks and stuff, and you know the race team. You know, with the pit the pit crew and everybody there, they do a huge amount of work. You know, they're the ones traveling around the world doing a ton of work. But all the people you see uh, on TV 
are have to have the support of an entire factory behind them that are, that have the computers and these servers that are collecting all the data, analyzing it, and then feeding it back to the people at the track to get the improvements. Um, so on Friday, that's what you do a lot. You you see a lot of um, random parts or um, data data logging equipment put on the car on a Friday to um, yeah. Uh, understand the car the conditions the track and try to optimize things because on Saturday you have qualifying which is um, they have a format where um, there are three qualifying rounds in the first round um, the the last the, the five slowest cars get knocked out in the second round in Q2 the next five slowest cars get knocked out and then in the Q3 the third qualifying round, you uh, have the you set the order for the um, for who gets pole, who gets second, who gets third, and that kind of thing. Um, and so, in terms of like actual time on track, and then again on Sunday you have the races. Um, so, and in terms of the actual amount of time spent on track for the drivers, um, yeah, you get two, four, well, anything about six to seven hours, I think, over a weekend on track. Um, but behind that, you know, basically it's 72 hours of, or more than that of just nonstop work from the time you arrive, you know, you're setting up all, all the stuff you see, the, the, the fancy pit boxes and all that stuff, everything that you see on TV has been put there probably within 24 hours, <laughs> you know, is, none, of that, none of that stuff's permanent. So they all have to be set up. That happens on the Thursdays. Um, Get all on track on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then Sunday, as soon as the race is done, everything is packed up, put back in the vehicles, and then either goes to driving to the next race, driving back to the factory, or driving to uh, an airport to get on a plane and get shipped off to the next race. So, um, in a in a race in a, any given race weekend, um, there's a lot that goes on um, aside from having cars on track. When your body is challenged, it burns fuel and energy. Respond to every challenge with Altitude Sports Drink. It replenishes, restores, and prepares you for the next level. Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. Altitude. Raise your game. Carl, Carbon Sports Entertainment Management Group. I was thinking about us having a, a Formula One team, but Antoine is scaring us here with, with, with all those logics that we have to go to, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, no, I'm, not, I'm not trying to scare you away. I'm trying to, you know, just warm you up, you know, let you know what we're getting into. <laughs> definitely. I mean, they definitely say it's a billionaire sport. It sounds more like a trillionaire sport to have... Um, <laughs> 1500 people to work for 72 hours, ship everything, yeah. on a plane, get everyone to another location, do it all again. But what I got from this, Antoine, so Lewis Hamilton and the drivers, they put a lot of time and effort into it. They're on the track for maybe, you know, two hours plus in a, in a, in a tournament. But the team behind the, the team on TV, you guys are literally on call for your some type of steroids to make sure that you are doing everything for the, for the guys that bring in the money because the drivers bring in the money, but you actually Absolutely. support the driver. Now, what I've yeah. always wanted to know is you have accidents just like the other day between Max Verstappen and Sir Lewis Hamilton. When those cars hit on impact and you see all the parts flying around, what type of course is that for the team and how quick are you able to put a car back together? So if someone hits the car in a practice uh, on a Friday, how do they get back on the track on the Saturday that quick? Who is responsible for that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's where the engineers and the mechanics earn their real money. Um, I mean, for me, like I'm a I'm a design engineer, so basically, I do I deal with things from a conceptual standpoint. You know, um, doing 3D models and then creating drawings and then basically building the parts that the drivers then go out and crash and break, <laughs> you know? So the, the once the, once they get, I, I, I get them on the car, once they're on the car, what they do with them, that's, that, that's beyond me. 
because the science of repairing um, crashed race cars, I mean, with the amount of damage, the, the amount of violence that they uh, these accidents can have can can have is incredible. Um, and what's even more incredible is like these cars get wrecked sometimes, um, but you know you can't just throw them away. You know these, they, I mean, big big money um, just for a chassis, you know, the suspension, um, let alone the engines and the chunks and stuff. You know, so big big money. And so you you can't you know you have to try to keep it. You have to try to salvage as much as you can um, to you know, catch can't throw things away. Um, but like I said before, everything's also custom made. So you can't just turn around and say, well, let's go in, you know, uh, just chuck everything onto a, a new chassis or something like that. You know, I, all these things have to be made and they would be made in advance, you know, because they are um, such um, refined and, and uh, expertly made um, components that you can't just turn around and make them overnight. Um, so, yeah, the, the science of, of getting a, a crash card's been ruined on a Friday back out on a Saturday, is, it's... It's really, really the, that's the top end sort of thing. Um, knowing how to um, assess the damage um, and uh, qualify if the car is suitable to be used again. You know what can be used, what can what needs to be thrown. Um, the parts that do get destroyed normally will be replaced just wholesale. So you have you know the the, the trucks that that drive the races. Um, come with you know tons and tons of spares you know more than enough spares to build a, a second car um and you know the, the components that we know are prone to damage you know we have even more of so particularly like you know front end the the, the front wings and and these kind of things that take, take a lot of beatings um and once they're gone um they're gone um you know right we're one of the, the biggest performance drivers in formula one is the aerodynamics and aerodynamics are very, very finicky um, things. You see all the little fins and little edges you see around the car. They look cosmetic, but no, like a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of computing power has been used to optimize all those shapes around the car to help to control the, the flow of the air um, around the vehicle. And um, these things are not just, you know, uh, a bunch of engineering nerds doing things because it looks good on the computer. Um, the drivers can feel when their error balance is is good and when it's not good, and it makes a huge difference. So um, I, that's another part of it um, when it comes to damage. You know, trying to uh, you know uh, make sure that everything from an aerodynamic standpoint is still um, working, functioning on the car takes a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of expertise and. Um, and a lot of data as well. I said, like I said, we can collect a lot of data to help us to to see the things that we can see on a computer screen that you can't see um, in just from looking at it um, with your eyes. And and yeah, um, the mechanics that work on these cars. I mean, these guys are best of the best. Um, yeah, they're they they're working around some some really really interesting um, projects all the time, and it takes. Yeah, a lot of a lot of experience, a lot of uh, um, knowledge to be able to to repair a damaged car. I'm I'm, I'm getting there, but I'm still <laughs> got a lot to learn first. I have one question for you, and then I will hand it back to Vernon. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about the tires? Because you know I like to watch Formula One, and there's always the issue: who's on hard tires, soft tires? I think it's dry tires. What is the significance of the tire change? Sure. Um, so Pirelli, um, they provide um, the tires to the entire, um, to the entire Formula One grid. Um, and on any, any given weekend, they bring three, three different compounds, three dry compounds to the track. So you have the red banded soft tire, the white, sorry, the, the yellow banded medium tire, and the red banded, uh, sorry, the white banded hard tire. So soft, medium, hard. Um, the soft tire, um, like it suggests, is the uh, the construction of the of the of the tire is made softer. Um, softer it is, the um, more traction it can it can put, provide to the car, um, which is good for obviously for qualifying. You want to have maximum traction, um, but you are 
going to lose out on the life of the tire. So after, you know, uh, maybe 10 laps, depending on the track, um, the, ten, the, the soft tire will start to, to basically wear out. And um, once, it get past, once it gets past its um, performance window, it's now, um, yeah, you're, you're going to start seeing your lap times increase because you're just not able, the driver's just not able to get the same feel out of the car. The medium, it's just like I said, it's a happy medium. And then the hard is the opposite. Um, it gives less traction than the other two compounds, but it um, it lasts longer. So, you know, you might see, like, for example, the last weekend, you saw some drivers start on start the race on the hard tire. And the reason they would do that and the reason they have different tires choices um, is obviously for to accommodate dif different cars that, you know, all behave differently. But also, uh, as a part of the rules in Formula One, uh, in, in, when you're having a race, um, it's a mandatory that you have one one pit stop. So you have to always have to have at least one at least one pit stop um, in during during the race. And um, you you also have to um, switch from one compound to another. You can't stay on the same compound the entire race. So if you if you're gonna do just one pit stop, then and you start the race on the hard, then you can't finish the you can't do your pit stop and then come back out on the hard. You have to go from a hard to either medium or a soft, but you have to do at least one um, compound change and you have to do at least one um, tire change, one pit stop during the race. Um, so it, it it basically from a engineering and from a competition standpoint, it adds um, element of strategy to the to the races. Um, you know, for, this is where, you know, you have the engineers and this is where, again, for the team standpoint, a lot, a lot of effort gets put into tire strategy, um, making sure you have the right, you're picking the right tire, picking it at the right time. You're choosing the time to do your pit stop for the ideal time, because there are so many factors into um, choosing when you do your pit stop. So, you know, if you have... A soft tire or a medium tire to start with, and you 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 you, you know that you can go maybe 40, 50 percent of the race on this tire, but you still have you know it's, it's open to decide when you want to come in and do your pits. Um, you got to take into account where you are on the track, take into account when you go do your pit stop, and you come out again. You know where are you where are you coming out on the track? Are you going to come out in front of your competitors, behind your competitors? You know. Uh, you can come out in a lot of traffic where you're going to worry about, okay, now I have fresh tires, but I have to deal with all these um, slow cars that are in front of me. So all these things are um, literally, they're modeled on computers um, in real time um, by the race teams um, to help help them to predict um, what their competitors are doing, what their tires are doing, and to help them, again, form a strategy that um, hopefully will get them the best results at the end of the race. You fix it. <clears throat> and this has been an incredible <clears throat> education period for us. But more so, on our platform, Women Strong, we have some ladies who are asking, and we also have a race car driver who's part of our team, will there ever be a Formula One platform for women? Yeah. Um, so right now, there's actually a very, very exciting um a race series called the W series. Um, it's I think it's it's under the FIA, which is the organizing body for um, basically all the top motor, um, motorsports. So it's you know, it's it's very widely recognized, and it's the W series is a women's uh, series. They drive um, Formula Three cars, which are so Formula One is the obviously the big ones. Then you have Formula Two that are slightly smaller, slightly slower, and then Formula Three are slightly slower again, slightly smaller. But these are um, very, very fast um, cars that you people, you know, basically actually going up the ranks. You go from Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 1. And the W Series is a Formula 3 championship um, exclusively for, for female drivers. And I've been seeing, I've seen some of the uh, races and it's actually exciting. I mean, really exciting. These ladies are incredible athletes and incredible drivers. And it's so, so important to, to see um, the quality of the talent and then what happens when you give people who don't normally get a chance a chance 
and, and a platform we give them an opportunity to show off what they have um and you know when it comes to one uh, uh, motorsports is one of the inter- one of the most interesting um sports for um you know mixed gender sports because um because we rely so heavily on the vehicles um you know this it's not about raw physicality that um can determine how well you do this at the sport um so in in in, a, in in some ways um women actually have a have may have a advantage over men um, when it comes to racing when it comes to driving um as you know generally uh women are are somewhat smaller and lighter um and we were talking earlier about saving mass well the driver's mass um includes it adds to the weight of the car so you have a light driver a small light driver if they're if they are small as in like short um it helps it makes them easy it makes it easier to build a car around them because they you know there's they they're more naturally more aerodynamic which we, we as engineers we love that and they're lighter you know again have, a, have an advantage there and so a series like the w series is really great because um it gives them it gives women a, a, a an opportunity to show that you know we can do the same lap times as the guys um and there's nothing there's nothing in formula one or formula three or any other the championships that stop the women from the w series to progressing into the what's seen as the more prestigious series and they can literally the effect women driving right alongside the men in um in uh, single seater racing um i my i'm not the best hist- uh, most most historian but i know there has been um uh, female drivers um for single seaters in, in in the past um thinking of indycar um, which is the uh a very close uh cousin to formula one um you had you know danica patrick who uh had a long career and a successful career driving at the top level in the indycar um, so that's what, yeah, Formula One's, I'm sorry, motorsports is really good in that, you know, and that, you know, where it, it, it's, it's, it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's simple, as simple as, you know, the fastest person's going to get, you know, the best drive and get on to you and, and, and win the races, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes in the background, but from a simple physics standpoint, there is simply nothing at all that, um, prevents uh, a woman from being faster than men. When I used to race bikes, um, actually, I'm, I'm quite quite happy to say, when I used to race bikes in the states um, in the AMA, um, I got my butt kicked by um, a young lady um, repeatedly. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I'm happy to say it because this is this is the same, this same young lady, but I want to become the first woman woman to um, to win to win a race in my class um, and and win races successfully, I mean, and, and convincingly, um, which again, just speaks to, um, you know, racing is, it's more about technique and bravery, um, which women are not short of. And so it's great, you know, you, it's, you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, the phys- you know, physical, them being physically roughed up because in, in a race car, they can be bullies just like everybody else. <laughs> When your body is challenged, it burns fuel and energy. Respond to every challenge with Altitude Sports Drink. It replenishes, restores, and prepares you for the next level. Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. Altitude. Raise your game. Cal, this is Wendy Edwards Ambrose. Edwards will certainly enjoy this conversation. And so the next time that we have Anton on, we certainly have to make sure we talk about woman power because you heard heard from Anton, he got his butt kicked. And trust me, um, you know, all men, all egos get bruised when women really jump on us. But that's good, woman strong. So that's a good conversation. And Hey, Antoine, you know, that was enlightening there because, you know, our platform is to make sure that, you know, we create dreams for both the boys and the girls. So 
Yeah. The, the young yeah. ladies, yeah, they too can be able to feel a part. Antoine, we're gonna just go on the grid, and then on the grid is just a more or less a, a questionnaire, and we just want to ask you in your downtime, what sort of music you listen to? Reggae, naturally, but um, I also like a lot of. I've been in England, so I, I'm starting to get into the uh, drum and bass and the electric music because when I'm doing my engineering work, it's it 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 suits me quite well. So you know, I, I, I I'm used to my foundation team from obviously growing growing up, but yeah, I, I'm 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 spreading out a little bit more. So depending on what I'm doing, if I'm if I'm if I'm doing like my design work, then I'm thinking probably listen to something like a electronic music. But anytime I'm relaxing, just around the house, then you know, I, I'm always just, I got my my uh, '90s reggae, and my early 2000s reggae that just stays on repeat. <laughs> got you. Racism in sport. You you're in a billion dollar industry. The name of this program is the Value of Sports, and I show that you've maybe not crossed paths yet with with some of it. Have you encountered anything while you've been? In this industry to date so my involvement in middle sports again goes back way before I, what i'm doing now in formula one um i guess i started racing bikes when i was 19 back in like 2007 so um my career you know has taken me um to yeah all over um i used to race in the states for a lot for a while and um yeah you know um I, I recognize now things that I didn't recognize when I was younger um, in terms of um, aspects of, of, of the sport that um, don't gel with my personal values. Um, and I also recognize how blinding you can be when you're in it to, to the things that are around you. So, like I said, I was like 19, 20 when I first started racing on the States and stuff. And, um, you know, I'm a young guy from Bermuda getting out the States to ride 600cc bikes at, you know, these great tracks and, and, and whatever. And I was, you know, I was pretty fast and, you know, I was well received. I was well received um, anywhere I went. Um, I would say it wasn't until later in life and, you know, just as I became more mature and also uh, the world as a uh, as one whole has been through a lot of changes in, uh, uh, recently. Um, that's really helped to highlight some of the things that I didn't recognize while I was in it. Um, or even if I didn't recognize them, I just didn't didn't care. You know, I didn't have the time to care. You know, I, it, it's, it's tough, man. You know, in a lot of ways, um, I was not just carrying the responsibility of being the fresh comedian to go out and you know race in some of these tracks and race in the AMA and that kind of thing, but also the only black guy around, like the only black guy for from for miles and miles. Like I'm talking about no one else around. Um, very few um, brothers in this wood um, at that at that time. You know, it's getting better now, and um, yeah. Um, it was it was about having it was about that time that I started to to um, or at least when I when I finished racing it was about the same time that I started to really take note of um, some of the subtle racism that I was seeing and hearing and that kind of thing while I was in it um, and it's it's helped to make me now um, be more um well first of all it's, it's helped to I, I know that i've been through it now so it's, it's definitely made sure that my my tolerance fragrance is it's is way way low now so i, I don't know i'm not putting up but i used to put up with no more um and um that's something you know i i also feel like now that i'm getting a little bit more you know i've been around this industry for, for a long time um it's it's almost um incumbent upon me to make sure that i make my voice heard um, when things start start going uh, I start hearing funny things or, or, and that kind of thing because um, because I know that there's gonna be young guys I know for a fact that young guys coming up um, who you know 
they'll probably encounter some of these things. And um, I know, you know, when you're young and you're, especially if you're racing, you don't have, you don't, you know, you don't get the opportunity to think of and, and on these things. You need people around you who are going to protect you from these things and, and just, you are going to stand up for you. He's going to, he's going to, you know, recognize um, some of the, you know, aggressions that come towards you and, and fend those things off to allow the racer to focus on racing. And so that's where, you know, it's important for platforms like this, you know, people like, you see some like, for example, Sir Lewis Hamilton, he's been in the sport for, you know, over two decades. Um, and um, I think most people who followed his career has seen a change in his approach to matters around race and motorsport. Um, then probably seen a very dramatic change um, recently. And I could I can relate to that a lot in the sense that when I first came into motorsports as a black person, you always know that like you're you, you kind of like, you feel like you're invited to somebody else's party, like you're the guest of the guests. So you don't want to come in the party and then start like making a big scene because you know you just you don't want to be rude and impolite and then get kicked out of the party because you know you're you're not you're not appealing to the host's sensibilities, um, and that's the feeling that I struggled with for, for a long time. And I think that someone like Lewis Hamilton will also relate to it. You know, he was the fastest guy. I mean, you know, look, he's seven-time world champion, and I I was hazard a guess. That for this, his, even in Formula One, his first couple of years there, you know, you have to really, you really can't be yourself um, until you've established yourself. Because if you start carrying on, you know, being too black in 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 these in these environments, um, opportunities can go quite quickly. Um, you can just find yourself all of a sudden hidden walls that you can't really explain from a sports point of view, they have to be explained from a broader point of view that includes politics and race and history and that kind of stuff. And, um, and yeah, so it's, it, it, it can be, um, it, was ne it was never a burden because I loved every minute of it, you know, and I love to be able to know that I contributed something towards helping, you know, the next generation of black riders come along but also it's something that you know you can't just stop you know you can't leave it to you, you know i can't just leave, leave it in the past because it's still here it's still it's still something that we're you know to this day we're still seeing um racism poking up um all over the place and it's something that you know we just can't can't tolerate it you follow football english Premier league football who's your team uh, I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a I'm a I'm a racing guy, man. Like uh, I I, uh, I I stay away from uh, football arguments. <laughs> well, the Carbon Sports Management Group would really like to salute you and salute you in a very 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 big way because this was a a touching interview for me, especially talking about racism in sports. And so for Carl and myself. This has been inspiring and you've started um, a new chapter, a new day, because this is what the platform is about. And we want to know what your experiences are and we want to be able to make sure that the young boy and girl understand that this world is not going to be an easy world. And so when you see success out there and you see the Sir Lewis Hamilton and you see the Carl Blankendell and you see the Dwight York and you see the Brian Lara and the Michael Jordan and the Sir Vivian Richards, you have to understand that there's a story behind their success. And so it was very, very, very enlightening and touching to have this conversation with you. I want your message to the future. Let me hear your message as we close out on this conversation on the value of sports to human beings. Notice that we have narrowed it down. We've not just said boys and girls because there's still hope for people and folks looking at this conversation you could inspire even one person with your message um i would say there are some really um good i wouldn't call them idols but you know 
pick good um, role models. Pick good role models. You know, uh, learn from from good people. And as you move upwards and you, you you're seeing success and seeing progress, it's it's imperative to make sure that you turn around and you help become a good role model for someone behind you. So we have, you know, as a community, we can see progress and we can see advancement across all human beings. You know, um, if, if it's it's the message is yeah, you know. Pick a good role model, and then become a good role model. And on that note, Kyle will close out this segment on behalf of the Caribbean Sports Management Group on the value of sports. Kyle, I am touched, and I'm really, really touched. And this is a this is a perfect start to the value of sports. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you to Mr. Antoine Richards. It's fantastic to have you on our platform. And Vernon may not know this, but from one onion to another, you've raised the bar without creating too many tears, but a lot of smiles on everyone's faces. Uh, first of all, you're in an industry which is not the norm in the Caribbean. Um, it's something that most young men and women of color are not really aspiring to or told about because of the challenges economically and also the educational setup where you know you're going into a different platform outside of accountancy and teaching and maybe a sports-based interest into something that is really high level intense you know i put you up there as a doctor or a scientist because you know those cars can actually make a lot of money they cost a lot of money but could they also save a life or kill someone and we saw what happened to sir lewis hamilton and max verstappen the other day when you know his safety features actually saved him because i think if he didn't have that he wouldn't be hurt but yeah. your story has been unique. Uh, I hope that it gets into a lot of schools and educational systems in the region to encourage our young men and women that the world is yours and no matter what you're interested in, it's up to you to make it. And that learning is always the first key to being successful in life. And um, sure. you made me look at the sport differently just because I understand the tire change now. And I wish you much success. And I hope that we can have you coming back at the end of this race season to talk a little bit more in depth about you know what was it like to be there for the entire year what was your experiences and let's have a little bit of banter back and forth about who's the best driver which is the best yeah. team. of course outside of your team which we're not going to mention but i think you you are an ambassador for the region you're an ambassador for bermuda and i hope that one day we can get you on a platform which we're putting together that you can actually sit with other greats and and, and share your knowledge and interest with other people all in the region because this is not a Bermudian platform. It's not a platform in Antigua or Jamaica or Barbados. This belongs to the Caribbean and you are yep. one of us. And yep. we salute you. And this is the first valuable sport. So I had to get a Bermudian there, uh, uh, Vernon. I had to put an onion on the first valuable sports and you've made us proud. So Vernon, thank you very much for creating this platform for us. Antoine, thank you very much and have a fantastic weekend. Thank you guys. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Kyle. I'm I'm pleased to be on here and I'm looking forward to seeing where you guys get next with this. This is really good. Thank you.